Those of you who just joined, my name is Zach Schalk. I am the Indiana Program Director for Solar United Neighbors, and we're here today to talk about the Hamilton County Solar Co-op. Uh, so first, I want to say a little bit about Solar United Neighbors. Uh, we are an, a national 501c3 nonprofit um, that's helping uh, to build a new energy system with rooftop solar at the cornerstones. We're really dedicated to helping people go solar, join together, and fight for their energy rights. Uh, right, right now we have uh, on the ground state programs in, in all of these states around the country. We just launched here in Indiana in January 2019. Um, so it's been a really exciting year getting, uh, getting up and running and, and the Hamilton County Solar Co-op is actually our uh, second co-op in the state of Indiana. Um, I also want to make sure to uh, recognize all of our wonderful partners and volunteers. Uh, we couldn't be as successful as we have been without the support of uh, all of the organizations listed here and their wonderful volunteers who've helped us spread the word um, and really make sure that we're building the strongest possible solar movement here in Indiana. Um, so really when we jump into the meat of the presentation here it's always important to start with a little bit of myth busting uh, when we do these presentations across indiana one thing that i, I often hear is um, you know does solar work um, and the you know the the answer is uh, unequivocal yes um, so what you're looking at here is what's called a solar intensity map this is from the national renewable energy laboratories and it basically shows the available solar resource um, across the continental United States. Um, and you know, it goes from, from red in, in the desert where there's the most available resource all the way to purple um, where there isn't quite as much available resource. And what's important to note here is the insert on the picture, uh, which is Germany, where uh, we've seen some of the highest uh, penetration of, of solar, especially rooftop solar in the entire country. And you'll see that it's well into the purple uh, the blue and purple spectrum on, on this map. Um, it, potentially even less solar resource than uh, Alaska, which is inset uh, in the map as well. Uh, and so you can see if Indiana has more solar resource um, than Germany, one of the world's leaders in solar, um, you can confidently say that solar works here in this state. Um, it's also important to know that solar has already been growing across Indiana. Um, here's a map from our friends down at the Southern Indiana Renewable Energy Network. Um, and they've put together kind of a, a visualization of how solar has expanded across the state. And we've highlighted a few key points here. Um, basically in 2011, that was the, the first time that uh, net metering, which we'll talk about more later in the presentation, expanded. Um, and, and that really kind of started um, the expansion of solar uh, across the state. Um, we've highlighted 2017 um, because that was the creation of Solarize Indiana, uh, one of our our key partners uh, here in the state. Um, and they were really responding to um, an anti-solar bill called SEA 309 um, that changed the terms of net metering um, in a way that we'll talk about later in the presentation. But that really spurred a lot of action, a lot of investment in solar. And as you can see between 2017 and 2018, um, solar has continued to expand around the state. Um, but it's not just expanding around the state, it's also expanding uh, right here in Hamilton County. Um, so these are just some examples of um, some of the large installations that have, have cropped up recently. Everything from Ikea, the Hamilton County Jail Complex, Sheridan Schools, and also uh, more recently, not pictured here, but the Hamilton Southeastern uh, School System just had a large solar installation um, uh, energized earlier this year. Um, but it's not just large installations across Hamilton County. There are also... Uh, regular homeowners um, who have been going solar. And, and really um, the Hamilton County Solar Co-op that we're doing right now uh, is building on the work of uh, Solarize Indiana and the local chapter Solarize Hamilton County uh, over the last two years in 2017 and 2018 where they've helped uh, 30 homeowners go solar um, uh, and, and communities all over uh, the county and Carmel, Fishers, Noblesville and Westfield pictured here. Um, and that was primarily a partnership between Solarize Indiana, Carmel Green Initiative, and Westfield Green Together, um, who are all also still partnering um, with us here today in the uh, Hamilton County Solar Co-op. Um, so again, solar doesn't just work here in Indiana, it's already um, in the community 
uh, throughout the county and Hamilton County. So what we're going to talk about uh, today is primarily the left column here. That's our solar co-op membership program. Um, and I'll dive into the details uh, throughout the presentation. But the key point to note is uh, basically what we're talking about here is a large uh, group purchase, getting neighbors and businesses throughout the community um, to go solar together and leverage their bulk purchasing power um, to get a great, a great deal uh, on solar. Um, and as part of that, you get a free one-year membership with Solar United Neighbors. It's where you get access to our, our help desk and our, our uh, technical support um, throughout every step of the process. Um, we do also have an option for people who are not living in an area where we currently have a co-op uh, open uh, to the public, and that's our individual membership program. Um, and so basically, uh, for $85 a year, you can get our help reviewing up to three proposals um, so we can help you uh, kind of figure out uh, what option is best for you. Um, but again, today we're going to be talking about the co-op membership, which is that left column. Um, so this, this program is completely free to join and there's no obligation to go solar. So this presentation is gonna be broken down into three parts. So first I'll talk about solar technology. Um, then I'll talk about how solar co-ops work. And finally, we're going to cover uh, some solar economics uh, and how the value of your solar system uh, uh, is, is recognized and um, how you can pay for it, which I know is what a lot of folks are, are interested in. So let's, let's jump right in, solar technology. So today we're gonna to be talking about solar photovoltaic or PV solar, um, and that converts solar energy into electricity for your home or business. Um, you can see rooftop solar panels uh, on, on this home right here. Um, there are other types of solar technology, uh, solar thermal, solar hot water, uh, but we're really gonna be talking about solar PV. Uh, so over the next couple slides, we're gonna be kind of walking through this diagram and describing um, how your solar system uh, works. Uh, but, but I wanna cover it a little bit up front so you can kind of be thinking about how these pieces fit together and then we'll come back um, to this, this image to kind of tie it all together at the end of this section. Uh, but basically what this shows is they're the main components of your solar energy system. Um, so the sun isn't numbered, but the sun is obviously a, a major component. Uh, but really we, we have the solar array, which are uh, a group of panels uh, here listed at number one. Um, and those panels create uh, direct current electricity um, that then flows down into number two here, which is uh, the solar inverter. And that's the part of your system that will convert that direct current electricity into alternating current electricity that you can actually use in your home and appliances. Um, and after the uh, electricity is inverted, it will flow into the electrical panel, that's number three here, uh, where that electricity will either get used up by appliances in your home, or it'll flow out through number four, the utility meter, and onto the grid where it'll, it'll get used up by your neighbors and your neighbor's neighbors until those electrons are spent. So uh, it's also important to kind of know some of the terminology that we'll be talking about uh, throughout this presentation. Um, so first of all, we have uh, the difference between kilowatts and kilowatt hours. So a kilowatt is a thousand watts. A, a watt is a uh, measure of power. It's kind of the capacity uh, and it's what your system will be measured in. Um, as you can see here, we have uh, 12 300 watt solar panels uh, in this in this image and that will create a 3.6 kilowatt solar system uh, because you multiply the 300 watts times the number of panels which is 12 and then you get 3.6 kilowatts with the kilowatt being a thousand watts um, but you'll also hear me say kilowatt hours um, which is a, a, a unit of, uh, a, of energy um, and it's it's what you pay for every much excuse me, every month on your electric bill. Um, so what you'll, the energy you produce will be measured in kilowatt hours, your capacity of the panels are measured in kilowatts. Um, and so you'll be hearing me kind of use those two terms throughout this presentation. Uh, most homeowners are gonna install a system between uh, two kilowatts, which is generally the smallest that a, an installer will, will do, um, to 12 kilowatts would be a larger residential system. Um, though through the co-op you, um, we'll be able to talk to your installer about your, uh, your energy needs, your usage, and your budget to make sure you get a system 
um, that is sized correctly for, for you. Um, the last point I want to make is just kind of the size of the panel. So this picture is kind of the scale. Uh, but basically, solar panels kind of range between five and six feet tall and about three feet wide. So, um, so that just gives you a sense of how much area we're talking about here, how, how large these panels are. So the first component we'll dive into are uh, the solar panels themselves. Um, the, the, you might also hear me use the word module. Panel and module are kind of interchangeable. Um, but basically, uh, the panels are made up of a bunch of components um, and kind of the solar cells are in the middle um, and the part that's kind of doing the work, capturing electrons, creating that direct current electricity. And then there's a series of uh, encapsulants, glass, uh, and the frame that, to help protect um, the, the panel itself. Um, and this, you know, this system is designed to be outside. Um, when you think of the glass, it's, it's tempered glass, it's thick, um, it's designed to handle uh, and weather the elements. Um, and then when you string a bunch of these panels together, uh, you get the solar array, which is just a series of panels connected into one system. Um, the next component, number two on that diagram, uh, is the inverter. So this is again where the electricity flows um, after the panels create direct current electricity. This is the part of the system uh, that converts that electricity into the alternating current uh, electricity that you can use in your home. Um, so there are a couple different types of inverters that are, are listed here and I'm going to talk about shortly, but uh, what's important to know is, is uh, you don't have to get bogged down in the technical details. Um, your installer will uh, make sure that, that you know the right uh, inverter that is uh, relevant for your system. Um, so you, if you have a preference, you can, you can name that preference, but you don't necessarily have to be the one making the decision. Um, so I'll, I'll start from left to right here. And the, the first uh, uh, inverter that we have is a string inverter. And that's kind of the, the, um, the inverter that's been on the market the longest. Um, it basically, it's called a string inverter because all of the um, panels of, of the, that make up the array are strung together, and then the, uh, the inversion happens in a single place. Um, and that can work really well. It's, it's been on the market a long time, uh, and it has a, a long track record of success, but it also has some challenges. Um, technically, because that inversion is only happening in a single place, um, basically, if there are any uh, differences in the production of any of the panels in the array, um, that can lower the overall output of, of the system. Um, so, so when you think about the string inverter, you can, you can compare it to kind of an, an old uh, string of Christmas lights, where when a single, a single bulb goes out, the whole string uh, of lights goes out because the circuit uh, isn't complete anymore. Um, and so to kind of recognize uh, or, or solve for that problem, um, microinverters were, were created, and that basically um, has the, the, the inverting technology underneath each individual panel. And so that allows um, for a more efficient uh, inverter uh, and a more efficient conversion of energy or of electricity from direct current to alternating current because it's happening at the panel level. Um, it does add cost and it does also add components, um, which can add to the complexity of, of the system. And, and so kind of, uh, to come together in the best of both worlds, we, we now have what are called string inverters and DC optimizers, um, which basically uh, has the capacity to optimize uh, uh, the inversion for each panel while still actually doing the inversion in a single uh, location for, to streamline for efficiency. Um, and so this you can kind of think about as like a newer uh, string of Christmas lights, uh, one where one light bulb goes out, but the whole strand um, still stays on. Um, Again, you don't need to worry too much about the technical details here because uh, when you get a custom quote from the installer through the co-op, they will recommend uh, the inverter that is uh, right for your system. Uh, so the next important component is the electrical panel. Um, and basically for, for most folks, the, uh, your solar can just uh, plug right into your electrical panel. It's, a, it's an easy um, connection. Um, there are some, if you have an older home or a home where the electric box is, is full for whatever reason, you might need a panel upgrade. Um, but if that's the case, um, the installer, when they come and look at your home, they will um, tell you whether or not you need a panel upgrade. And as part of the co-op process, we ask uh, for uh, transparent pricing 
on panel upgrades. So you'll know exactly how much that will cost if that is something that uh, you'll need to consider. Uh, so obviously another important component is how this will actually attach to your roof. Um, so that's, that's the racking. Um, underneath, underneath each of the panels, um, there are physical components that will not just uh, attach to your roof, but then also um, connect to the panels themselves and hold them in place. And so the important thing to note is that basically for whatever roof type you have, um, there is a solution uh, for, for you. There are some roofs, uh, for, for most folks who have uh, a pitched, uh, pitched asphalt shingles, um, there's a very, very traditional solution for, for other roof types. There are some that, that may maybe cause uh, a little increase in cost, uh, but most installers uh, will work with whatever roof type you have. Um, and and so so that's something that you should <laughs> we should know what what your roof type is ahead of time but but know that there's probably a solution for you um, when in the example of a pitched asphalt shingle roof um, what you'll see here the common uh, a solution is what's called this, this flashing here in the top left basically they re remove one of those shingles um, drill down into uh, the support of, of your roof um, uh, to connect uh, very securely. Uh, they fill that hole uh, and then cover everything up with the flashing that basically acts like another shingle. Um, here you can see a, another example on a, a standing seam metal roof. So this is actually a really simple uh, type of installation because typically you can just uh, uh, clamp right on to the, the standing seam um, without having to penetrate the roof. Um, and that's, there are other types of non-penetrating installations as well, if that's something um, that is appropriate for your roof. Um, also, for, for folks who maybe uh, their roof is covered or they prefer to not uh, use their roof, you can have a ground-mounted uh, solar installation. Oftentimes, the uh, mounting on the ground does increase costs um, as you have to bury, bury the cables and, and build a little bit more infrastructure, but that is something that is available um, through the, through the co-op. Um, so a, a question that often comes up is uh, what makes a good roof for solar? So there, there are a couple key components uh, to consider. Um, one is orientation. Uh, the kind of traditional best orientation is, is south, uh, but panels are efficient enough today that you can really uh, be facing east or west and still be producing uh, plenty of energy. Uh, really, you just don't wanna be facing north. Um, you also want to try to avoid as much shading as possible. Uh, so you want to be uh, maximizing your energy production during the day. And if, you're, if your panels are, are shaded, you're, you're not going to be producing um, energy. So especially during kind of peak, peak sunlight hours, um, you know, during the day, 10 to 2 or, or longer, depending on where you are, um, that's when you want to make sure that your system doesn't have shading. Um, but again, if your system might be partially shaded during certain parts of the day, that's where um, having uh, different, uh, either a microinverter or the um, uh, optimizer uh, inverter will, will help you still maximize your system production. Um, you also need to have enough space to mount the panels. Um, so that's, that's important uh, because the, the you need at least, we say 200 uh, contiguous square feet uh, for that small two kilowatt system size. Um, and if your system has to be Kind of spread out in different spaces, um, you know, it'll it'll add to the complexity of the system and increase your costs. Um, so having enough contiguous space where all the panels can be uh, right in line is definitely the best um, the best option. Um, and the final thing to consider is the age or condition of your roof. Um, the, our kind of rule of thumb is if you're going to need to replace your roof anytime in the next ten years, and you should probably go ahead and do that uh, before you install the solar panels. That's just because it's pretty expensive to have the panels taken down and put back up um, if that is something that you need to do after you've installed them. Um, another component uh, that we wanna talk about briefly, even though it wasn't on that diagram, is batteries. Um, so basically, uh, batteries are an important uh, component of your system if you're worried about what happens when the power goes out. Um, when the grid goes down, for most systems, most inverters, your solar, uh, your solar panel will stop uh, producing electricity as well. Basically, there's a safety mechanism that will shut the, the power off. And that's, that's just to protect any line workers who might be working on the system. 
Uh, we don't want to be sending out electricity onto the grid while somebody is trying to fix it. Um, there are inverters that are on the market now that will allow you to island um, and allow you to continue using, using your solar without batteries, uh, but those do increase substantially in cost. Um, but you can, you can ask your installer about that. Um, so, but if, if you do uh, want to consider these options, uh, there are a few things to consider about battery storage. Uh, first of all, it is good for backup power. Um, so if you have frequent utility outages or critical loads like medical equipment at home that you need to make sure always running, or if you're really uh, conscious of emergency or disaster preparedness, um, it might be worth looking into battery storage. Um, but it's important to note that uh, you're probably not going to save money and you're not going to get paid by the utility for providing um, benefits to the grid uh, by using your batteries. So, so right now, batteries are still very expensive. They add, they add costs and complexity to the system. Um, but there, there could be a good solution for you if you're um, worried about these other things. Um, so I'm not going to talk much more about batteries um, today. But if, if you are interested in learning more, I encourage you to go check out our uh, battery storage for homeowners guide. It's a free um, easy to, to read and digest um, public facing guide that you can download at solarunitedneighbors.org slash storage. Okay, so that is kind of covers uh, everything in this diagram. Just to, just to review, um, the solar panels uh, capture electrons from the sun and produce direct current electricity that then flows into the inverter where that DC electricity is converted to AC electricity that can then be used um, by the appliances in your home. Um, that electricity flows into your electrical panel where it either goes to those appliances or flows back out through the utility meter onto the grid. Um, so I know that's, that's a lot uh, of information, but hopefully um, easy to digest. And if you have any, any questions, um, we can answer those at the end of the technology section here coming up. Um, but I know one question that tends to come up next is, okay, well, what happens to that electricity that flows out uh, of your utility meter back out onto the grid. And so that's where net metering comes in. So basically net metering allows for that flow of electricity to and from customers. Um, so the way you can think about this is, is when you generate more electricity than you use, that electricity flows back out of the grid and you can get a credit that rolls over month to month on your electric bill. So your electric bill becomes the amount of electricity used minus the amount you've produced. Um, and if you've actually produced more than you've used, then you end up with a net credit. So I know this can be kind of a difficult concept for, for folks to, to understand. And I think that this, this visualization really helps make it a little more concrete. Um, so what you're looking at here uh, is two uh, uh, estimates of, of solar production, one version at the daily level and one at the monthly uh, over the course of the year. Um, so where solar is kind of the orange, um, on, on both charts, and uh, the, your energy usage is the blue. Um, so what you see here is that your energy usage kind of spikes in the morning when you're getting up ready to go to work, and then when you go to work, uh, drops back down, and then it comes back up, you know, when you get home in the evening, you uh, crank down the AC or turn on the TV or fire up the microwave, and you see a spike in demand that kind of stays steady until um, you go, go to bed, and it slowly starts to taper down. Well, your solar is going to be producing its, uh, most of its energy during the day, obviously, when the sun is out. Um, and so what you see, that, that gap there, is kind of the excess uh, during the course of the day. But if you look over um, on to the monthly uh, production, what you see is how in the summer months, where you're probably going to be producing the most throughout the course of the year, um, it's very likely, depending on your system size, uh, and this is, I think, assuming a system that's designed to cover 100% of your net energy usage over the course of the year. Um, when, you, when you look at, at this graph, you see that uh, from April, potentially March, all the way through uh, September, um, in, this, in this example, this, this uh, system is producing more than is actually being used. And so all of those excess uh, months, you're building up uh, kilowatt hour bill credits that then you can spin down and the winter months where you aren't producing as much electricity as you use. Um, so you use those credits up actually before you buy uh, uh, kilowatt hours from the electric utility. So that's how net metering creates a solar offset that can be used throughout the year. So um, what's important to note is, is uh, that the net metering law in Indiana 
uh, that was passed in 2017, that's, that's S SB or SEA 309, um, is gonna be changing this arrangement in, in the near future. Um, so basically, for systems installed before, roughly before July 1, 2022, um, those systems will receive that, receive that full retail rate net metering, that one-to-one -one kilowatt hour swap that I was just talking about until 2032. Um, systems installed after 2022 will not receive net metering. Um, there is some squishiness in the timeline here, but the, what's important to note is that if you install your system um, within in the next year in, in Annapolis or, or Hamilton County, um, you, will, you will definitely be able to receive net metering until 2032. Um, so after net metering ends, instead of getting that one-to-one -one net metering rate, um, homeowners are gonna be credited at a different rate, which actually hasn't been set yet. So there's some ambiguity here that we can't really uh, fully talk about um, with, with precision yet because the regulators um, haven't set this rate yet. But according to the law, it's going to be something like the locational marginal price, which is typically about a third of the retail rate plus 25%. Um, so it will still, you'll still be getting a credit for your excess electricity. It just won't be the full value of the retail kilowatt hour that, that you cur currently get and, or would get until 2032. Um, and so the last point I want to make here is less about the policy itself and more a political point. Uh, because the reason that the electric utilities were able to push through this law, and to be clear, this is a law that they, were, they have been pushing in a lot of other states. This wasn't just an Indiana initiative, um, but it's, it was, Indiana is one of the few states where it was successful. Um, but the reason they were, they were able to push that law through is because the electric utilities and the interests um, who are organized against uh, customer-owned rooftop solar were organized and solar supporters like us weren't. Um, so we are still fighting to build a solar movement today because there is still time to change this policy and make sure that uh, rooftop solar, customer-owned solar, uh, dist other distributed energy resources are, are fairly valued on the market um, and to make sure that uh, ratepayers and homeowners and businesses are the ones who are able to benefit from these clean new energy resources and not just uh, electric utility shareholders. Okay, so I've been talking a lot at you, um, and I know I've covered a lot of ground. I do just want to cover a few of these uh, frequently asked questions, um, and then I can check to see if we have anything in the Q&A pod. Uh, but so one uh, important uh, frequently asked question is about warranties. Um, so there are a few things to consider on warranties. There are, there are really three main types of warranties to consider. Um, so first is the production warranty, and that um, is variable from, from panel to panel, producer to producer. But basically what it says is that um, your, uh, your solar panels will be guaranteed to produce at a certain percentage of their uh, day one nameplate capacity uh, 25 years down the road. That's really the industry standard is a 25 year life cycle. Um, and for most panels, that uh, production guarantee is anywhere between 80 and 90%. Um, at the end of that 25 year life lifespan, it's not like your system will just stop working. It'll just start getting uh, less efficient. Um, the second warranty to think about is the equipment warranty. And so, and, and this usually uh, lasts anywhere, depending, again, depending on the manufacturer and uh, the actual equipment that you're using. It can be anywhere from five to 10, 12 or 15 years. And that's to cover if something actually breaks. Um, not the production itself, but just if, if something physically breaks in the system. Um, and again, that can last anywhere between five and 15 years, depending on the manufacturer. Um, and then the third warranty is uh, the labor warranty, and that is the agreement with the installer um, that they will cover um, anything that, that, that is responsible, that they're responsible for as part of their, uh, their labor agreement with you. Um, and that depend that uh, varies drastically from from installer to installer, and I've seen anything from a one year warranty to a lifetime warranty. So it really varies varies widely, and is is an important thing to consider um, when looking at at your quote. Um, a nice thing about being a part of the co-op is that when when you join the co-op, uh, you will get a, a clear package of information that that has not just all of the costs uh, clearly lined out and what to expect. Uh, but also the warranties uh, clearly listed out so you know exactly what to expect 
and you have something to reference when you see the actual uh, the actual proposal to make sure that you're getting what, what you were promised. Um, homeowners insurance is another key thing. Uh, for, for most folks, um, it really doesn't have uh, much, if any, an impact, uh, but it's important that you notify your homeowners insurance when you add solar panels uh, to your roof um, or anywhere on your property. Um, for some folks, you can actually get a, a credit for, for installing solar. So it really depends on your homeowner's insurance, uh, but uh, the important thing to note is that uh, it, it, this will not add substantial costs to your, to your homeowner's insurance. Uh, maintenance is another uh, key question, and the great thing about uh, rooftop solar is that there's very little maintenance. It tends to clean itself uh, when it, uh, it rains or snows, especially if you have a, a pitched roof. Um, it tends to, you know, there's not, there's no moving parts, um, so there's not that much that can break. Um, so it's a very, very low, uh, low maintenance uh, piece of technology. Um, I, I already kind of mentioned this about, about weather damage or, or uh, snow cover, uh, but basically these panels are designed to handle the elements. Um, oftentimes in the equipment warranty, there will be specific, uh, specific mentions about different uh, Parts of, of weather damage uh, that's covered, uh, but but really they're designed to be outside. They're designed to last for 25 years, um, and so they're they, they can handle what Mother Nature will throw at them for the most part. Um, and as far as snow cover, um, you know they tend they're they're designed to absorb solar energy, so they tend to help help snow melt um, quickly. If that's not, if you're worried about snow falling off your roof, you can actually add what's called a snow guard um, to kind of uh, have add a protect, uh, protecting layer and so that thing not everything uh, slides off at once um, but for most folks you know snow even here in Indiana is not a not a huge concern. I'm already kind of touched on how long your system will last again that uh, 25 years is kind of industry um, standard but your system you know there are solar arrays that have been online much longer than that and are still producing electricity albeit at a less efficient uh, rate. Um, the question of homeowners associations is a, a tough one here in Indiana because it really depends on your HOA. Um, there is there are other states where there are laws in the book saying HOAs cannot keep you from going solar, um, but here in Indiana we don't have that law. Um, that's actually another reason we're trying to uh, build the solar movement to fight for uh, better protections for uh, solar or folks who want to go solar who live in homeowners associations that don't currently allow them. Um, but if, if you think your HOA uh, might cause some trouble, uh, you can reach out to us and we will help you with that. Your installer will also help with that. Um, I can say that um, among the 30, <laughs> excuse me, the 30 uh, homeowners that um, Solarize Hamilton County has helped go solar over the last couple of years, several are in HOAs, including uh, several HOAs that actually had somewhat restrictive covenants that they were able to work with them to change. <clears throat> excuse me, to allow, allow them to go solar. So we can actually connect you with solar homeowners who overcame uh, barriers from their HOAs in your area. Um, and hopefully that can help uh, smooth the process if that's something that, that uh, is needed for you. And lastly, on historic districts, um, it, again, there are no clear uh, statewide guidelines here. Um, but if you do live in a historic district, you can generally uh, petition the historic district and they, they might have some architectural or aesthetic uh, uh, reviews uh, that you'll need to consider uh, before they allow it. But, but there are multiple folks in historic districts uh, in Hamilton County and Indiana, Indiana more broadly uh, who have successfully gone solar. So that's something uh, that we can help you with and also something that the installer can help you with. So that is the end of the technology section. Um, I want to pause here to see if there are any questions. I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A uh, the Q&A pod right now, but I do want to give folks a, a space to add questions um, if you'd like to. So uh, if any questions come up, feel free to type them into the pod and uh, my colleague Corey will either answer for you or we will um, we will read them out loud. Got one here, Zach. Uh, do you have a list of HOAs that do or don't allow solar? So we are actually in the process of compiling a list where we know uh, for sure that they allow solar because we've helped people, uh, or our partners have helped people install solar there. There is no central database, uh, unfortunately. So the, the best way to tell is really just to, to pull up your, your bylaws or, or covenants. Um, and 
<coughs> oftentimes you can just kind of do a control find search um, for solar to see if it's, it's mentioned at all. Um, but uh, if that's something you need help with, uh, feel free to follow up uh, after this. Um, and you, can, you can even send the covenants my way and I can, I can help you uh, figure that out. All right, I think that's the only one we've seen. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move on. But please, again, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to drop them into uh, the pod and we'll, we'll get you an answer. Okay, so the next part of the presentation is about how solar co-ops work. So solar co-ops are, um, are really a, a great way for you to get a value out of uh, this process and get the best value in the installation. Um, we provide uh, non-biased technical support throughout the process and also help you connect with fellow solar enthusiasts. So you're not just benefiting from our support, but you're benefiting from uh, being part of a large and growing solar movement, um, not just in Hamilton County, but throughout the state. Um, basically, the, the co-op process, uh, we have it divided here into a couple different stages. Um, but we, we start by trying to grow the group as large as possible and, and getting out into the community um, to help people learn about not just the co-op, but solar uh, technology in general through presentations like this. So we've done, uh, about, uh, I think this is the fifth presentation that we've done for this, uh, this co-op in particular with a couple other uh, kind of smaller community presentations around the county um, since we launched in August. Um, we try to get as many folks as possible to sign up. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And then we, we get to the part where we um, issue a request for proposals from area installers. And so we actually did that um, in September and selected the installer uh, at the beginning of October. And, and so we are past that process and are now kind of coming down the home stretch uh, where the co-op is open for new, uh, new members through uh, the end of the year, through December 31st, but we already have an installer. So as soon as you sign up, um, you'll get connected immediately with that installer. You'll know exactly uh, what their winning bid was, and and the important thing to note there is that um, this the the installer review process was conducted by a group of your peers. These are volunteers from the co-op um, who sat with us and reviewed all the the bids that we got side by side, uh, took a look at at the kind of track record of these installers and and what they were offering to the group, and made a selection uh, that they thought. Uh, provided the best value to the group and aligned the best with the group's interests. Um, and so the installer that was selected is called Jefferson Electric. They're based in Indianapolis. Um, and that's who you'd be connected with to get your free um, custom quote through the co-op. Um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. Um, so basically uh, how this would work is that uh, when you join the group, you would be connected. We would do a roof review first to make sure that your roof um, seems like it would be good for solar. Um, you would be connected with, uh, with the installer. Um, you would work with the installer to conduct a site visit, and then you would receive a custom proposal based at that group, group rate uh, with the co-op pricing that you will already have uh, be aware of and, and know to expect. Um, you will then basically have the opportunity to, to review that bid and decide whether or not this is the right time for you to go solar. Um, up, up to that point, this process is completely free and there's no obligation to go solar. So this is the decision point where you can see an actual uh, custom proposal um, that, that is designed for your specific property um, and just decide whether or not this is right for you. And then if you do sign the contract, um, you'll get your system installed. Um, and then at the end of the day, uh, whether you signed your contract or not, since you were part of the uh, the co-op process, we throw a party and we want to include you with that in that solar celebration um, because we are serious about building this, this solar movement and we want you to be a part of that whether you end up going solar or not. So uh, basically, uh, I mentioned this briefly, but, but the co-op members who uh, select the, uh, the installer consider a, a whole number of criteria including price, equipment quality, warranties, um, the experience and, and business location of the installer. <clears throat> and, and while I can't uh, tell you the details of the, the winning proposal, the winning bid, um, until you join the group, I will say that the Jefferson Electric was selected specifically because of high quality equipment and a, 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 a good warranty um, at competitive pricing, and also being a, a, a relatively local um, vendor based in Indianapolis. 
So that's the, the nuts and bolts of the so uh, excuse me, the solar co-op process. Um, now let's go ahead and talk about economics. So one thing that's really important to note is that solar is increasingly affordable. Basically, since the technology was introduced in the 70s, it's uh, decreased by uh, 90%. Um, and even in the last 10 years, um, solar has continued to decrease substantially in price. So it's really no longer just a specialty or expensive boutique uh, uh, item. It's, it's something that is, is attainable uh, by, uh, for more and more people. Um, but before we really dive into the specific cost of solar, I think it's really important to put um, put this in context, because uh, you aren't just buying solar in a vacuum, you're really buying it in the context of your electric bills. Um, you're gonna be paying somebody for electricity over the next 30 years. And as you can see here from this chart, where we're showing um, the historic averages of uh, Duke and uh, IPL's electric rates, um, those, those rates have been going up and up and up consistently. So, so you can think about solar not just as buying this whiz-bang cool technology, or some kind of clean, uh, an investment in clean energy, but really in taking your next 25 years of electric payments and bundling it up front into an investment that will uh, show a return, um, rather than just paying your electric bill month to month so that Duke or IPL shareholders um, can benefit. And it's also really important to note that Duke is right now uh, in the process of trying to and at a, a historic rate increase. So over the last 10 years, they've already seen uh, their average bills go up uh, by about $300 a year. Um, and now they wanna add another $300 a year on the average customer bill um, based on a, a filing that they have before the IURC. Um, so this is a, a great time to be looking at a solar investment really as a hedge against those um, outrageous increases that are being proposed by Duke. Um, I also wanna talk a little bit about the, the overall cost of going solar, just to put it in context. So, so this, is based, this, this chart here is based on industry data. Um, it really kind of breaks down the different components of um, the cost of going solar. Um, so what you see here in yellow are the, the system components, the technology itself, not just the solar panels, but also racking and, and other equipment that are necessary for the installation. I mean, as you can see, that, that has been kind of steadily declining in line with what uh, we showed on the, the chart earlier. Um, the gray part, portion in the middle is the labor cost, and that has also been declining as the industry has been getting more and more efficient. Um, and then we have the orange up top. That's the soft cost. Um, so that's acquiring customers, marketing, um, those kind of other costs that, that add to the installation. And what you can see here is that while the rest of the, um, of the costs have been steadily declining, those soft costs have really stayed um, pretty stubborn. And what's nice about the co-op process is that uh, the co-op directly cuts into the soft costs by helping uh, reduce the marketing and customer acquisition uh, part of installing solar. So that's really where the solar co-op can help you see savings um, by being part of the group. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so now we're getting to the moment that I know everybody's been waiting for with example pricing. Um, so a few caveats here before I dive in, but basically uh, what we're looking at here is um, example pricing based on uh, kind of industry averages. Um, and, and so this is not exactly what you would see on your custom quote, either through the co-op or if you just went out in the market. Um, every individual um, solar installation has different factors, um, different factors of return, different factors of the installation itself uh, that add variables um, to the cost of going solar. But what's valuable about this chart is, is not necessarily seeing the specific dollar amounts here, but really seeing where the value of your system uh, would come from over, over the course of your investment. Um, and so I'll walk through, through this chart here so we can kind of get a sense of that. So, so what you're looking at here are um, two different perspective system sizes. One, a four kilowatt system, and one, an eight kilowatt system. And just to give you a kind of rough, rough, uh, perspective here, um, you know, an eight kilowatt system would be a relatively large, uh, large system, but not, you know, a, a, an average large system uh, in Indiana. 
and four kilowatts uh, for a lot of folks would, would cover anywhere between 30 to more than 50% of their annual energy usage uh, based on folks that we've, we've talked to. So it just kind of gives you a sense of, you know, for, for an average person, kind of maybe roughly half of your energy usage versus roughly 100% uh, of your energy usage over the course of the year. Um, so so what, we, what we have here is a uh, per watt price of $2.56. And again, that's based on um, kind of uh, industry uh, averages that we've seen. Um, and that gets you to the top line number. Uh, so you multiply uh, 2.56, by uh, 4,000 for the four kilowatt or 8,000 for the eight kilowatts, and that's how you get that top line price. Um, so then uh, you can take the federal tax credit, uh, which uh, it, we list here as 26%, and I'll talk about uh, why that is here in a minute. You can, you can take that off the top. Uh, that is a non-refundable tax credit um, that applies to the entire cost of installing the system. Um, and so basically, you know, when, what you're left with is a net cost after the tax credit of $7,600 for the four kilowatt or, or just over $1,500 for the eight kilowatt system. I'm gonna skip this SREC line for a moment to come down to where you're seeing uh, estimated savings. So what we've done here um, in these, these rows for estimated savings are take, uh, taking that, uh, that data that we had about uh, Duke Energy in particular, since most folks in Hamilton County are in Duke territory, um, taking Duke uh, Energy's current electric costs, adding a very conservative um, uh, step up each year, and then basically projecting out um, how much you can expect to save on your annual electric bills at these different system sizes. So we have one year cumulative savings of $600 for the larger size, I'm sorry, the smaller size, and $1,200 for the larger size, and then 10 year cumulative savings of $6,300 for the smaller or nearly $1,300 for the larger. And then we stop these projections at 2032. And that's because of that net metering law that I talked about uh, a little bit ago. Um, we don't wanna project past that because the credit uh, is likely to be changing or the current law on the books says that that credit will change and we don't know what the next credit will be. Um, so we stopped there just to give you what we are sure about or what we can uh, fairly project and at the end of, of that 13 year period, even despite uh, only being a less about halfway through the lifespan of your solar system, um, you, you're still seeing a profit of $800, uh, a projected profit of $800 on the smaller four kilowatt system or $1,700 on the larger eight kilowatt system. And that is all coming from electric bills, cumulative electric bill savings over time. Um, at, especially as the electricity rates continue to climb. Um, so, but that's not to say that your investment will stop uh, seeing a return or saving you money after 2032. You'll still be seeing savings. Um, it just will be different and we don't wanna project out. But a good way to think about it is you're already well into your payback period. So everything that comes after 2032 will be a profit. Um, so I do wanna briefly step back up to the solar renewable energy credits line. Um, that's listed as a question mark um, here because solar renewable energy credits are basically a, uh, a financial product, a market-based financial product designed to represent the green value of the electricity that you generate. Um, and so we don't have a market here in Indiana, uh, but Indiana solar owners can sell into the Ohio market. Um, the reason it's a question mark here is because it's this is a, a fluctuating market product and uh, those fluctuations have been very dramatic. And actually in recent months, a piece of policy that passed in Ohio has effectively killed this market for now. Um, so these credits are trading at only a couple of dollars a credit. Um, and just to give you a sense of, of how many credits you produce, that four kilowatt system uh, would produce roughly five of these credits a year. So, so right now, uh, with, the, with the market trading at around $5 a credit, you're only probably going to be seeing, uh, you know, not very much uh, money per year on this. And there is some paperwork and uh, brokers that you need to go through traditionally. Um, so for a lot of folks, it's probably not even worth um, making, taking the time to, to sell your SREX. Um, but if that's something you're interested in, you can talk to your installer and they will help you out.
Uh, I think I saw a question come in. Uh, just to read the question out loud, Nate, Nate asks, what if you will be out of your house before uh, the break-even point? Uh, that is a great question. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, and some, something that I will be uh, touching on uh, shortly, but basically uh, one way to think about it is that sol investing in solar um, will be increasing your property value. So if your plan is to sell your home before you reach that break-even point, you can still be seeing value from this uh, because uh, industry studies have shown consistently uh, that adding rooftop solar does increase uh, value for your home. Um, that being said, there is no specific uh, market research that's been done in Indiana, so it's hard to put a specific dollar amount, but I think it's fair to say that if you put a, a dollar into your solar system, you should see that uh, as a dollar that you, you see uh, increasing in your, your, your resale value of your home. Um, but it, it's also important to note that even though it's increasing the value of your home, um, Indiana does have a property tax exclusion for renewable energy investments. So you will not be increasing your tax bill while you are still in your home. So that, that's a benefit that only, uh, that doesn't carry over when you sell your home. So the next person who buys it won't, won't get that benefit. Uh, but if you're the one who makes the investment um, in a renewable energy system on your home, uh, then you will not see your property tax bill go up, even though your um, appraised value will go up for your home. Um, so Nate is following up saying, I've seen some estimates on that and they are likely high. It's still only worth what someone would pay for it. That, that's fair, so the, uh, the market is, is the market, so there's, there's no guarantees here. Um, I'm just uh, telling you what industry data um, has shown. All right, I, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the federal investment tax credit. Um, so right now, um, this tax credit is 30%. It's been, it's been a great tool for helping to expand uh, the market in solar as, as it, it directly lowers costs. Um, and it's important to note that the tax credit can be spread out over, uh, over up to five years. So if you don't have enough of a tax bill to use the credit, because it is non-refundable, um, in a single year, you can, you can use it in a, over the course of five years. Um, so the policy on the books right now says that the federal tax credit is going to begin stepping down. So even though it's 30% in 2019, the reason we listed it at 26% on the pricing chart on the previous slide is that in 2020, uh, it's scheduled to step down to 26%, and then in 2021, it's scheduled to step down to 22% before completely phasing out in 2022 for residential customers, or residential installations, I, sh I should say. Um, and most folks, uh, if you haven't joined the co-op and gotten a quote um, up to this point, um, you're more than likely going to see your installation in 2020. Um, so that's why we're using the 26% number. Um, but what's important to, to note here and why, why we visual, wanted to visualize it in this way is to show that that step down from 30% 30, 30 to 26% um, is really not, you know, we're talking a couple hundred dollars there. And this is actually using a base assumption uh, that the cost of going solar will not be going down, which will obviously change the dynamics here as well. And, and we've seen historically that the cost of going solar has been going down. So this is a bit of a moving target, but the key thing to take away here is that even if you aren't able to go in 2019, or instead looking at 2020, 2020 for your installation, you're, you're only missing out on a couple hundred dollars of benefit, which, which in uh, the context of uh, a large investment uh, of solar is um, you know, relatively, relatively small. Um, but again, this, the, the pricing will be different through the co-op and um, your individual system size, which will determine the overall cost of your installation, um, will be different based on the individual uh, needs of your property. Uh, I guess one other point I want to make before, before moving on here um, is that there is a bipartisan piece of legislation uh, that has been introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives and in the Senate. Um, to actually extend this tax credit at the full 30% value for an additional five years. Um, and so that's another reason we want to build this solar movement. 
so if that's something that you're interested in fighting for, you can go to our website, uh, click the Take Action page, and you can find an action that will make it easy for you to contact your representative and ask, uh, ask them to support um, this legislation to make sure the tax credit doesn't step down uh, for the next five years. Okay, uh, so the last thing I wanna touch base on here is other financing options. Um, so uh, most installers do have financing available and the, the installer that was selected for the Hamilton County Solar Co-op does also have financing, uh, a financing option that you can take. Um, however, uh, installer financing does tend to have a relatively high interest rate. Um, <clears throat> so it's important to look at your other options if financing is something you're interested in. Um, you can take a standard loan uh, for, for this. Um, or uh, for a lot of folks, a home equity line of credit is, if that's available to you, um, is often the best source of financing. Um, you can also get what are called solar, solar loans or, or solar bridge loans. And oftentimes those, the, the bridge loans in particular, are basically designed to give you a, a low or zero interest loan for the value of your uh, investment tax credit to help you get to um, your tax return. So you pay it off once you've actually been able to monetize that tax credit. Um, and oftentimes these loans can be structured in a way where your monthly payments are actually lower than uh, what your overall uh, monthly electricity bill savings are. So even, even though um, you're still paying, paying the loan off, you're still seeing savings uh, every month uh, because of the, the value of the solar system. And there are also uh, grants available if you, um, if you live in a rural area and, and have a rural business. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, uh, please let us know and we can talk about the funding available through the Rural Energy for America program. Okay, so that is the economics portion. What's next? Uh, I would encourage you to please join the Hamilton County Solar Co-op. So you can do that by going to solarunitednneighbors.org slash Hamilton County and clicking on the join, join the group link. Um, you'll fill out a, a quick form. It only takes a couple minutes to fill out. <clears throat> excuse me, that form will ask for some information and, and, and help us find your, uh, your address so we can uh, pinpoint your roof to do a, a remote roof review to make sure uh, that we think your roof would be uh, good for solar. Um, uh, but then basically once you're, once you're in the group, again, the group is completely free to join with no obligation to go solar. Um, you'll be connected with the Jefferson Electric, the installer selected by your peers in the group uh, to, to serve uh, the co-op and we'll begin the process of getting a custom uh, a custom quote. Um, we're also still trying to grow the group uh, through the end of December so please tell your friends, neighbors, colleagues, anybody else who you think might be interested in, in joining the co-op to uh, sign up today. Uh, here's what the the web page looks like so you know what to expect um, and that's all that I've got. Thank you so much. Again my name is Zach Schalk. I'm the Indiana Program Director for Soul United Neighbors. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can email us at inteam at solarunitedneighbors.org.